a really nascent idea that I've been rumbling around in my head, which is essentially that product management is dead as it moves further away from business leadership and into mm -hmm. micromanagement of functional leaders or functional, both functional leaders and um, working level. I'm trying to use the this PDF that's in front of me. Um, functional managers or actual engineers. So thing to say it a different way. Which PDF, is this the, uh, the Google Doc? The podcast show topics, or this is, is the research gate article I've read a couple oh, times. Right. You, yeah, the, right. That's linked. That's linked here. Got yeah, it. the Stephen Wheelwright. Oh. It's this. It's, so you have functional team, lightweight team, heavyweight team, and autonomous team, and everybody does yeah. some some hodgepodge mix of these various organizations. And I've never been in part of an organization that does any one of these purely. They they sort of switch between them. Because it's like Agile or anything else. No one really does it. They kind of take their own spin on it. But the thing that's rattling around in my brain is that product management is largely dead because of where it's headed in terms of roles and responsibilities within organizations. You're listening to the Proof Partners podcast. For more information, check out proofpartners.io. Right. Even though the language around it has been like, um, you know, there's a lot of thing like kind of sort of meme ish themes, right? Like uh, from project to product, right? Like we don't have project teams, we have product teams yep. and sort of a industry push to say we're changing the way we do things from a project based teams to product based teams. And but I never really actually see that right. any change happen besides the labeling. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's my that's my takeaway is that it's kind of like agile. You know, it's a name thing. It's not a practice thing. Right. And so you, you take what recently happened at Spotify where they where they adopted the the Apple model of product managers are only responsible or primarily responsible for marketing. And then everything falls away from there. So it's a marketing first. Would you, would you consider Spotify a successful model to use? Like, haven't they lost like billions of dollars in revenue around their product? Whatever they were doing I mean, before guess, is the before, right? And whatever happens after the switch is after. So I, I guess it's yet to be seen. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because a lot, a lot of people point to the Spotify model. Right. Even the old one yeah. or have right yeah. uh, lightweight product teams etc cetera, etc cetera. and um you know my fundamental question is is it really successful i mean it's great if you can market it and talk to it and have buzzy words around it but is it actually you know is it is it actually successful and what does success mean right to me it's releasing high quality code f as frequently as possible Interesting. Interesting. So you wouldn't put it like bottom line increases. I would, I would assume maybe I'm wrong that the bottom line increases are a long tail indicator to re releasing high quality code frequently. I agree with that. I agree with that. Look at, look at, um, Twitter or X, right? Sure. They released something like 600 features since Elon took over right. 600 and something features to the platform, which is more feature releases than Twitter had had in its existence prior to that date. And he, and he fired 80% of the working staff. Right. Right. Um, so that is going to inform the bottom line numbers at some point. They have an ad model now. They have a revenue share with their users. The, uh, the activity, like the, the logins and user activity is higher than it's ever been. The engagement level is higher. Those, those will at some point, you know, if not already, reveal themselves in the reporting on the, the financial health of the company, I think. So to me, that from a, from a team structure point of view, you're saying that success is measured at that level and then impacted at a higher level, right? And so you wouldn't necessarily, and I think this is, a, the reason why I, I, I narrow in on that is because product managers are right in the crosshairs of that exact idea. 
are we essentially right. functional managers where the the tightness of the cycles is what we measure success based on, which is what you're saying, right? So iteration cycle, mm -hmm. you know, is it is it two days or is it two months? Yeah. Versus money, you know, bottom line revenue increase. Yeah, well, there's there's obviously a little ambiguity in that, right? And there's probably some slack in that um, num bottom line numbers to, to quality and frequency of code. And how do you measure quality and frequency is a good question as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, and mean time to recovery between an exit defect that's pre-production and post-production, how, how quickly does the team iterate on that and come out the other side with a quali uh, an even higher quality release. Those numbers, I think, just show the engine of development in an organization is running really efficiently. Right. And if the engine is the, the development engine, if you can feed in a bunch of inputs and get a reliable level of outputs at a predictable quality level, mm -hmm. that is going to make you money even if you're off base with your product design and your ideal customer market fit and your go-to-market strategy, you could be off with all of those things. But if your engineering teams are ability, have an ability to deliver frequently, then you can course correct and fix those product fit, product market fit problems, business problems. You can fit all of them because you're just, it's just another input into a highly efficient engineering, um, you know, engine power plant, right. if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. That, I, I think time to iteration is is key. I'm not I'm not sure about team makeup that gets you there, right? I I think mm. sort of my my fundamental problem with papers like this particular one is that it's purist, right? It's academic, right? And and as soon as you get into a team, you've you've always got the person on the team who's you know the curmudgeon you've got these different personalities you've got the person on the team who's enthusiastic no matter what and so on and so you've, you've always got this in practice you've got something that requires moment by moment leadership and decision making mm. and and i think the evidence of that or the outcome of that is that while you can have these academic discussions about you know heavyweight team versus autonomous team structure what actually happens on a day-to-day -day basis the success of that or the how tight those iterations are is all about leadership mm. and it, you know yeah. I, don't, I don't see no, a I lot of that being discussed in these well no these are like these are structural representations of what teams are they don't account for the the wild card variable which is humans right um but i think you might have a high level of success with any number of these or a blend of these team structures if you had a really effective leader over those teams exactly that's exactly it. and so I, this is where culture wins right, right 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 the leader brings in a culture the team either assimilates to that culture or creates a blend of that culture right hierarchies develop in the team right and they're probably coloring outside of the lines of the organization's structure to begin with to facilitate that culture, right. good or bad. Right. And then the result on the other side, I think, is, is large, the largest factor in terms of influence is probably the leadership. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. So to go back to the, to the X or Twitter example, how much, is it, it, how much of it is just Elon? <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, right. Just right. Somebody and, there who's and, like, okay, let's break stuff. It's okay. It's also the, <laughs> right, right. And there's also somebody that's like a hundred percent owner in something right. with all of the autonomy and all of the leadership levers at his disposal and can make highly high risk decisions with complete impunity yeah. right like yeah. do, doesn't have to ask a board doesn't i mean you know there are those things i guess they're bringing into play but but i know that i read in some of his posts that his primary objective was to get engineering working at, at twitter um and a good way to do that if you're if you have balls of like for watermelons for balls <laughs> You fire eighty percent of the company. Right. I mean, he has something like fifty engineers left. Right. <laughs> what are you gonna yeah. And there were like 
I don't know, 3,000 or something was, crazy like that, right? Yeah. Um, and his talk on that is great, and that's a whole like politically trolled out stuff around why and what they were actually doing. But when I read some of the posts around their software development life cycle, there were no lower environments. It was just prod. Everyone was just working in prod. Wow. And, the, and you can imagine like how bad things were with everyone just working in prod. So I think you probably had to stratify the environment structure, right? L lower and upper environments. Sure. Probably had to get some testing stuff figured out. Um, then there's probably disentangling an algorithm that was doing something that you didn't know it was doing because it was developed over years, 10 years. Right. Um, it's actually an amazing feat to, that they even stayed up <laughs> during that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. Outside of like confirm, we both I think we both see this the situation very similarly. What is it that a what is it that a C suite or a group of leaders leaders could do prior to making a structural change to sort of dry run it in the org and f have some some data to drive their their anecdotes or their their theor theoretical designs right what, what is it because you all hear about tiger team set up a tiger team to do this if that's effective then grow it or you know what what do you, in your mind what are like three things that leaders could do to better make those changes because you're going to make them anyway, right? So, like, right. I think there's there's two. I don't know about three, but I can come up with two pretty quick. The the first is, the very rarely, do I find C-suite folks who have an articulatable, that's a word, mission, saying here's here's what we're after. Besides, you know, mo money, right? Like an actual mission of of why why people are getting up in the morning, why they're investing their time, why they're, why they're missing their kids, you know, baseball practice or whatever. Um, so the first thing is, is having a mission that's, that's articulable. And then the second is measuring the right things around it, right? So we talk about, you know, development cycles and timelines and so on and so forth. The, the right thing to measure ultimately is always increased margin or, you know, more revenue. But it's, that's, that's never the reason why people go to work. And so, you yeah. know, I've, I've, the, the really common one that I like to pick on is, you know, how many people are in a chair in an office? You know, people measure that. And whether they like to admit it or not, they, they consider that a measure of success. And if you want to talk about, uh, you know, a leadership mistake at sort of the most intrinsic level, measure the wrong thing and see how you do. Yeah. And I think, so uh, measurements is so important. It's so critical to understanding what's happening because things are constantly moving and, and having a measurement model with agreed upon influenceable metrics in there is really, is really key. And I heard someone say once, and I'll probably screw it up, but if I use a tape measure to measure this table and I really don't understand the tape measure, everything I measure after that is a, is a unit of representation of that table. Right. Well, that's four tables, right? <laughs> that's 28 tables. That's one, one hundredth of a that's table, exactly it. you know? And, and then when, when we start to talk to leaders about measurement models, they, there seems to be an understanding of what, the, what it is they're looking for, even if it's inarticulable to the workforce. Right. Right. So, mid 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 level managers or directors vps whatever i think their job is to actually create the language around what is measure what is measurable and and what are the units of measurement and what and are they agreed upon and are they inf influenceable by the team then once you have that i think a great example of this is and i uh, this is something i heard, overheard in a conversation recently if you have if you are measuring the number of pull request approvals in the org and the goal is to understand if the team is collaborating or not, if somebody does a hundred pull request approvals in a week and there's zero comments on them and zero third party comments on right. them, yeah, exactly. then they, they can be, you can say you're pushing through pull requests and code is getting out there, but you're literally not looking at it. Right. You're just rubber stamping right. it. If there's a, if you did five pull requests, in that week and there were five comments back and forth between the committer and the and the reviewer 
that's real collaboration, right? right. And, and then, and then, uh, and then a, a subsequent set of commits after that that get squashed, merged, and pushed out. Sure. You can now really show, uh, you know, collaboration. But if if everything comes into a merge request model or pull request model and no changes happen, why are you doing it? Right. <laughs> You're doing it to satisfy the the standards and the, the structure that was put in place to ensure quality code, but you're not actually doing all this, of it. This is, this is exactly the reason why measuring the wrong thing is so dangerous is because humans will automatically start to, to game those things, right? You want to measure yes. whether or not people are in the office, people are going to swipe in and then go home, right? Like you want to measure whether right. or not people are collaborating by number of PRs, then there's, the PRs are going to go up. You want to do points? <laughs> well, guess what? Your sprints are going to be shock full of points, right? Like it, so it sort of doesn't matter. But, you know, to take one of the conversations mm -hmm. we had earlier this week, you know, you, you want to do innovation, we'll measure the number of, of patents that come out in a given 12 month you know, or patent applications, mm. you know, so, yeah. so it, it's sort of like, you've got to get that long-term view into your measurement cycle and, and make sure that you have the leaders in place to go after it versus getting into the weeds and measurement can be really, yeah. Really and I, I, I think it's simpler when we talk about measurements and all of these different like dimensions in which you can view the output of a, a group of a, a group or many groups of, um, you know, engineers or who, people, whoever, I think it's important to just keep it really simple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like what are the things that matter? Like if you met, you know, there's the old expression of monitoring from the spout. And if you're close to your customer and you're in the feedback loop and getting that feedback direct from a customer mm. as a leader or a customer facing person in the organization, that data needs to get all the way back into the teams and have a understanding and also have a common language to talk about those things. Cause I've seen this many times, customer facing person, salesperson, account manager, whomever engages with a customer to get a bunch of feedback. And then the message that comes back to the architecture engineering teams or leads that doesn't have anything to do with actually what the customer is looking for. <laughs> right. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, Oh, we, we want to see more blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I can't even think of an example, but that translates to something completely disjointed from the team. And now they go off and they might be in one of these four quadrants, you know, one, one of these four groups. Right. And they're like, yes, we have our liaison. We have our project manager and we're going to ingest this stuff and, and we're going to, you know, have an output that satisfies the needs. And then, and, but there's a massive disconnect between actually what the customer is looking for and what the teams are working on. And we see this all the time. And then there's, there's there's uh, other layers below that where a leader in an org says I want this and everyone hears a different thing and goes and does it completely like their mental model is not in line so their approach is not in line and I think that's a really it's a really core part of it is like how well understood is the language across the organization about what your what your goals are what your north star is I think I think you hit it early on in, in, in all of that, which is essentially, it's it's just gotta be really super simple. Met, metrics that are really hard to understand across, as the, as the org grows, you want people to approach that destination from a number of different ways. You want that multiplicity of ideas and creativity, and you need them all to work towards the same goals, right? And, and so mm -hmm. that's, it goes back to the, like this, this document that tries to like create typologies about different, different ways. I think you want it to be organic if you can handle that, but the way you, you, you make it all work and still maintain that organic approach is to have really super clear metrics that everyone can, can understand and go after. This is, this is like the, the whole, you know, how do you measure a symphony success and its number of standing ovations, right? It's not what kind of music. Mm -hmm. It's not how many seats are full. You know, you could have one person there, but if he loves the music, that's actually more important than how many tickets you sell. That's a really, that's a really right? good Because point. then it'll circle back around and you will sell tickets. If every single person who goes in there has a, it gives you a standing ovation, eventually you're going to solve the ticket problem. Yeah, that's the long tail problem, right? right. Yeah, right. So it's long tail versus short tail. And then it's, you know, every single performance that's all anybody who's who's playing looks at is, are we going to get a standing ovation? I'm working towards that thing. I can do it any way I want. I can be on any instrument I want, but am I going to get a standing O at the end? 
or like three of those types of metrics that are completely customer driven. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Right. Exactly. But super, super simple that anybody playing any instrument in the organization can, can latch on to. It can't be technical. It can't be sales. It has to be something higher level than that. How big a part does the organization's core values play in? <laughs> like the, you're going to get me started on core values. <laughs> right. Well, I think, it, I really do think it's essential. So I'm like, I'm just teeing up softballs to you here. But like, that's, that's if, the, if the value system, <laughs> if the value system is, is well understood and defined, then the language that emerges from the hierarchies inside that value system should also be easier to get across to people because there's, there's a example, a reference in behavior in service of the value system that can be described in only a few ways, right? So how important is that value system to having an ontology, a well-understood ontology in the organization? That's such a good question. I, I think like the, for organizations that have these really intrinsic cultural touchstones, I'm intentionally not using the core values, but cultural touchstones, I've rarely come across an institution or organization where those cultural touchstones are codified in a core value. They almost never match. So you'll have mm -hmm. you'll have an organization that really cares about people being on on prem, right? So I want everyone to be or really, you know, the opposite. Everyone has to be remote. We want people to be at home with their families. And then their core values are, you know, something like, you know, collaboration. And you're just like, wait, what? Like those two things are already disjointed. And you've got to fix one or the other. You either have to fix your core values so that they match what you're actually thinking and doing in those, you know, those cultural touchstones, or your cu cultural ch touchstones have to change. And oh, well, the, the values should be actual values. They like should actually honesty, be honesty, courage. You know, like like there should be something that's really simple to understand, and they don't have to rhyme <laughs> or start with the same letter. <laughs> Don't make it harder than it has to be, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you can have a value, but it has to start with uh, with the letter X. <laughs> so, it, it my I have I have so many thoughts on core values. I've done a lot of work on this in, in over the course of my career. But the very very in a very short way, core values are the thing that make you different than everybody else. So, if your core value is is honesty or integrity, that ain't a core value. That's something you want to do because if you don't do that, you're you're an asshole, right? Um, a core value. If you have to say that you have to do ex it, ex something else <laughs> may not be <laughs> right. Right, exactly. Like I'm an early riser at this law know? firm. We want everyone to be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do we cheat them? And Is that how? a problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, core values. Wow. Known to the vagrants in in Harvard Square as <laughs> Screwy Louie and Dewey. Uh, That's an old reference, folks. Uh, you have to be get back on your and get your NPR game up to snuff. <laughs> Turn on your radio. <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah. We'll have to do one just on core values. But I think when it comes to I think when it comes to team, let's see if we can summarize this. When it comes to team makeup, there's there's no there's no blueprint that works for everybody. I think I think mission is way more important than than top down uh, description or mandate of how this stuff works. I think mission and and measuring the correct thing for your organization somewhere between uh, increased revenue, which is which is too money driven, and you know number of lines of code, which is too detailed. So it's it's somewhere in the middle of that you have the thing that you're measuring that's that everyone can can latch on to and go after yeah.